You're listening to the podcast of the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Matt Berkman. Due to the coronavirus crisis, today's interviews were conducted over Zoom, so please pardon the audio quality. Our guests today are Saed Achan, Assistant Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies at Swarthmore College, and Katarina Galore, Visiting Associate Professor of Judaic and Urban Studies at Brown University. Together, they've co-authored the forthcoming book, The Moral Triangle, Germans, Israelis, Palestinians, which explores the legacy of the Holocaust for contemporary German politics surrounding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and for questions of free speech and democracy in Germany more generally. Professors Achan and Galore, uh, welcome to the podcast. First, can you give us a sense of the issues at stake in your book and tell us how you went uh, about the research you did? Hello. Um, so our book, The Moral Triangle, Germans, Israelis, Palestinians, is looking at Germans and Germany's moral responsibility towards Israelis and Palestinians within the city of Berlin and within Germany more broadly, both in light of past events and history, the Holocaust, and also with regard to the ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict. And while there is some scholarly and also public interest in the topic of the recent massive migration of Israelis to Berlin, and also in the subject of Berlin's Palestinian community, which is about twice as large as the Israeli community, there is no one who has previously examined these three communities in relation to each other. And while it may seem obvious that there is a close link that ties these groups together, Germans, Israelis, and Palestinians, this discussion touches upon multiple taboos that we felt we had the agency and even to some extent the responsibility to touch upon, to discuss to expose. So Ed, maybe you want to say a few words about the theoretical framework and the methodology that we used? Absolutely, I would be happy to do so. So for us, the moral responsibility is a central and anchoring concept in the book and that we really used for our interviews to try to understand how different Germans, Israelis and Palestinians in Berlin today feel about the question of Germany's moral responsibility towards Israelis and or Palestinians in the present. And we found many different points of view from the point of view that there's a moral responsibility toward one community, towards the other, toward both or neither community. There are also people who were quite apathetic. So we found that to be incredibly fascinating. And Kati is a German Israeli scholar. I'm a Palestinian scholar. We did field work in Berlin, about a hundred interviews, both uh, semi-structured and more informal interviews, as well as ethnography, participant observation, deep hanging out in the city, attending film festivals, meeting people in their homes and cafes to get a real sense of the richness of the Israeli and Palestinian social fabrics in contemporary German society in the nation's capital of Berlin. So it was actually an incredibly exciting project and it allowed us to meet all kinds of people from many different walks of life. And it also allowed us to understand what's at stake in terms of bringing together issues of Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, migration, the legacies of the Holocaust, trauma, moral responsibility, state society relations, diaspora communities in Germany today. So there is a lot at stake and we feel that in our book we did our best to really uh, flesh out some of these debates. Um, so in addition or beyond the um, questions about uh, free expression, democracy, and the German state that I'm going to ask you about a little later, what are some of the main or uh, most interesting findings from your research that you can share with us? So so I can go ahead and, and start. Uh, so I will say that, you know, we, we think about this idea of a, of a moral triangle that connects Germans, Israelis, and Palestinians. And one of our more, more upbeat sort of positive uh, findings was that there's a lot being done in terms of restorative justice 
and reconciliation and healing historical wounds between Germans and Israelis. Germany is in many ways has opened its doors to Israelis and many Israelis feel welcomed and embraced in the German capital in Berlin. We also found that there are these points of intersection and opportunities for collaboration between Israelis and Palestinians, which and we have a whole chapter in the book devoted just to that. And we also have some images and photographs from the city that we think are quite compelling. But what we found was that the German-Palestinian part of the triangle, of this moral triangle, is actually the one that has a long way to go and that there is much to be done at the state level, public discourse level, civil society level, and grassroots level to actually tr promote greater understanding between Germans and Palestinians and to make space possible for Germans to recognize their relationship not only to Israelis but, all, but also to Palestinians. Professor Galora, I was wondering if you could say something about um, the discourse on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in Germany. I understand this is uh, one of the main topics of the book, so I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. So, um, well, also with regard to democracy, so Germany has a robust democratic constitution, the so-called 1949 Grundgesetz für die Bundesrepublik Deutschland, the basic law for the Federal Republic of Germany, which defines, in fact, many aspects of German society, its uh, domestic and foreign policy, and this basic law, however, um, does seem to often stand in contrast to Germany's official position vis-a-vis -vis the state of Israel. Uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel and many other politicians before her have in fact insisted on, on their raison d'etat, in other words, their unconditional commitment to the security of Israel, which basically justifies any and almost all acts of violence and human rights violations against Palestinians. Um, and despite this very, very laudable acts of self-reflection regarding the crimes that were committed during the Holocaust and also the recognition of Germany's responsibility, which um, Saed um, previously touched upon, uh, which is a process known in German as Vergangenheitsbewältigung. The other side of this is the equation of Israel criticism with anti-Semitism. And one of the more awkward results of this is uh, something we encountered again and again as we we're conducting our research in Berlin and, and, and the many interviews is um, that um, that many of the um, Israelis who come to Berlin, um, who are um, mostly young intellectuals and artists, are often very critical of their own government. And, um, and this creates this awkward situation where on the one hand, Germany is extremely pleased that there is this revival of Jewish life in in Berlin or Germany more, more broadly speaking. But on the other side, because they're critical, these, many of these Israelis are critical of uh, Israel and Israeli politics. And while they're committed uh, Jews and feel very Jewish, they're being defined as anti-Semitic by and Germans. Is the state, is the German state involved in regulating freedom of expression around these questions and how has that manifested itself? Um, and it, what are the ramifications for uh, democratic norms in Germany? So there, I think there is a clear um, censorship of Palestinian voices. Um, I think that um, Palestinians, Germans, um, are the ones who suffer from this the most. I mean, Germans cannot show solidarity with Palestinians openly, publicly, um, and Palestinians can basically not touch upon anything that has to do with the Israel-Palestine conflict. I mean, it's, there, there's very clear regulations and restrictions in Germany. Are there examples can, of this that you can point us out? 
Well, we're bringing many examples in the discussion of our book of, um, of lectures um, that were uh, boycotted or that were canceled because uh, the presenters, including Israelis, including uh, Jewish academics who, who are um, critical of the Israeli state, uh, had to be canceled. So, Professor Achan, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, the reactions to this suppression of Palestinian speech in Germany. Um, is, are, are there any organizations that have mobilized against this? Is there a kind of a German ACLU? Are there Palestinian groups that have worked on this? Um, yes. What has the reaction been like? Yeah, I wouldn't argue that there is an equivalent of the ACLU in Germany today and the way that free expression and freedom of speech manifests itself in the US and German context is quite different. I, I think that Kati and I would definitely say that we're sympathetic to the real sensitivity to issues related to the Holocaust, to anti-Semitism, ensuring that people are not inciting to violence in public, that people are not um, in any way bringing Germany back towards, you know, a very dark and unfortunate past. Nonetheless, you know, those currents do exist, and we can talk about that in a second. But when this is conflated with very legitimate and thoughtful critiques of the Israeli state, and as Kati said, you know, when you have this knee-jerk accusation of anti-Semitism, in the German context, that can be very damning, and it can actually be a kind of social and political, uh, you know, suicide in a way to express these points of view publicly. What we found is that privately, Germans, Israelis, and Palestinians were much more willing to share their points of view, their concerns about Palestinian human rights, etc. But there was a palpable sense that if they were to do so publicly, they risked being labeled anti-Semitic, and then they actually risk their careers, their reputations, their social standing. And for Palestinian Germans in particular, there was also a sense that they don't even feel they can express their Palestinian identity publicly, given all of these the forms of censorship and surveillance. So it was actually quite dispiriting, and we, we could feel just the suffocation that people feel living under this um, form of, of profound guilt for the past that's leading to uh, censorship in the present. So, you know, recently we've seen uh, the rise of xenophobic nationalist parties across Europe, uh, particularly in the wake of the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, there's the far-right Alternative for Germany party that won uh, about 12% of the vote in the recent federal elections in Germany. How would you describe um, the situation of Palestinians in Germany uh, kind of with respect to these broader trends in Europe and also the trends you're talking about. Yeah, so the AfD's popularity is really a great concern for Germany, for many Germans who are working so hard to not let the past resurface. Now, one of the AfD's open agenda agendas are their anti-immigration views and their opposition to Islam. And the majority of Palestinians in Germany are Muslims. Most of them are of an immigrant background, many of whom escaped um, Lebanon during the civil war. And among the nearly one million refugees from the Middle East, primarily from Syria, who arrived in Berlin in 2015, there was also a group of Palestinians for whom this was actually their third relocation, first from Palestine or Israel to Lebanon or other countries and from there to Syria and from Syria to Germany. So Palestinians clearly suffer from these open forms of xenophobia and Islamophobia in particular as the IFD and also their ideological ally Pegida is gaining recognition and power. And while there are some individuals associated with the AfD who are also openly anti-Semitic, it appears to be less of a problem than the much more, much more visible and also consistent xenophobic and Islamic, uh, Islamophobic currents. Uh, the party also generally seems to advocate for support of the Israeli state and, and its security. 
how how do you compare the situation in Germany to the situation uh, elsewhere? Is Germany really an outlier in this regard um, on these questions of speech around Israel Palestine, or uh, do you see that the situation is similar in the United States? Um, or in other countries that you might have studied? Well, I think one way that Germany is different and fascinating and also disconcerting is that we see these trends in terms of suppression of critical discourse on Israel-Palestine, not only on the far right, but also on the right and also in the center and also on the left and also on the radical left, which was utterly, utterly surprising and quite fascinating for us to find so that you will find individuals who in Germany are progressive on so many issues but when it comes to this issue Palestinian human rights is thrown basically out the window and there's very very little regard to it and there's a huge emphasis on support for the Israeli state and so all around the world you will find progressive movements and movements on the left aligning themselves with progressive causes and Palestinian human rights is considered a, a fundamental part of the global social justice landscape in the West and across the world. But in Germany, that is different. It doesn't mean there aren't people on the left in Germany who are sympathetic to Palestinian human rights, but you will have plenty of people on the left in Germany who align themselves with a racist, xenophobic, militaristic, occupying Israeli state and who express significant amounts of affection and respect for figures like Benjamin Netanyahu, who simultaneously is allied with groups like uh, the, 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 the right and the far right in the US and other parts of Europe, etc. So th there's a lack of self-awareness about this being an issue. But what's happening is that as Germany becomes more and more cosmopolitan, this is starting to change, especially with uh, immigrant communities, migrant communities in Germany who will have a more critical perspective and they're slowly uh, agitating to get their voices heard. But also in Berlin, it's such a cosmopolitan city that brings people from all over the world, all over Europe. What we find is that when progressives from different cities across Europe and different parts of the world come to Germany and they're in Berlin specifically, they're interfacing with Germans and they're pushing Germans to think more critically on this issue and they're introducing a more robust Palestinian solidarity, Palestinian human rights discourse. And this is causing some uh, cleavages, but it's also causing some, uh, at the, some recognition among the German left that they need to be more open. So kind of switching gears before we end, I wanted to, to wrap up by asking you uh, what you can tell us uh, about how the German government right now is dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and particularly in relation to other states. And yeah, what, what, what light can your, your expertise shed on, these, on this question right now? So, it, it, so there is this weird phenomenon in Germany currently, which I think sets it apart from all other European countries and their discussions about whether individuals and the various lender um, countries should take regional or federal directions with, with regard to their behavior in that light of the uh, current recommendations to isolate or to quarantine. In Spain and in Italy, the population seems thankful for the clear guidance that the respective governments provide and viewed sort of as a measure of self-protection against a dangerous virus. And in Germany, there are endless discussions in the media about whether a political authority should have a say about individuals or if these directions should be views at, viewed as um, too restrictive and as impeding to people's lives and basic rights. And it, it is clearly a trend where the general germ anxiety surfaces and um, their commitment to um, democratic prin principles of, um, of freedom of movement and, um, and decision. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's very strange to follow this in the media. And, and I think it's again, very much related to this um, anxiety about the past to return to um, the Nazi era or to return to 
um, to communism. So the, there's this incredible commitment to democratic values and the anxiety to return to something that is very restrictive. Interesting. And is that is that uh, hampering the response to the coronavirus in noticeable ways? Well, I don't know how it will evolve over time. I mean, currently, with something that is strange is that the only land or uh, that is uh, following these direct uh, that has very strict guidelines is Bayern, Bavaria. And ironically, the, the land that has the most cases of coronavirus is um, uh, Nordrhein-Westfalen, uh, Westphalia. And uh, this is where people seem to be behaving the most liberal. And, and the guidelines seem to be very loose. So that's, that's very strange. So I, I'm not sure how this will, in, into which direction this will develop. Mm. Professor Achan, do you have any uh, sense of what, how this coronavirus pandemic is affecting uh, the West Bank and Gaza? Yes, so uh, the first two confirmed cases in Gaza have now manifested. And as you can imagine, the Gaza Strip is under just utter, utter panic. Uh, people are absolutely petrified. It's one of the most densely populated areas on earth, and they have no capacity to respond to such a crisis as a result of the Israeli blockade and the shortage of access to electricity, to clean water, to sewage treatment, to basic, basic health infrastructure. So as you can imagine, Palestinians, both in Israel, Palestine, and in the diaspora are holding Gaza in the light and are holding their breaths. In the West Bank, the, the scene is a little bit more optimistic. There have been confirmed cases in the West Bank, um, specifically in Bethlehem, and all the major Palestinian cities and towns in the West Bank have been under closure and lockdown, including my family and loved ones, and they have been resilient and, you know, they've been patient and they understand that this is necessary. Uh, and they know that they will get through it in the long run, and they're used to uh, being under lockdown, unfortunately, um, and they have mechanisms to cope. But but everybody is looking really to Gaza with uh, real trepidation, and we just have to keep our fingers crossed that it won't spiral out of control there. Yeah, these are very frightening times, and I really thank you both for being on the podcast. Thank you, Matt. <laughs>